and hello everyone. Welcome back to the Hammered Lampstand. I'm David, this is my better half Shelby, and we're here to bring Christ to your life, to teach you God's word, to bring you closer to God, and today we have a very special chapter. We're going over Genesis chapter four. Yikes. It's a tough one, That's the but first it's a good murder. one. The first religious war, if you really think about it. Is it a war between one-on-one? -on -one? I feel like it is. Hmm. I feel like that's more of a fight. <laughs> well, well, it's going to escalate, so don't but you worry. you know what it is? Fratricide. Fratricide. Great day to talk about fratricide. Killing your brother. Great a, great a day as ever. <laughs> Yay. Okay, yes. So last chapter, Adam and Eve got cursed because they disobeyed the one rule that they had. And now here we are in chapter four. Yep. We finished Genesis chapter three. We learned about proto-evangelism. Yes, and which is the, the first mention of the gospel. Absolutely. Uh, because not only did God curse them a little bit, but he also issued a promise that there was going to be a savior born that would help uh, alleviate all the crises of the world. And you keep saying he cursed them, but don't forget he didn't curse them directly. He only ah. cursed Satan the saint, the uh, Satan the snake directly. True. He kind of cursed their efforts. You know, like they, you have to toil extra for the ground. You're gonna right. have to toil extra for childbirth and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where we are starting today in Genesis four. Amen. <laughs> yes. Start it off. Yes. Please do the honors. Okay. Genesis 4, mm -hmm. verse 1. one. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Woo! Right off the bat here. Yes. So um, sometimes it's translated that man was intimate with his wife. Yes. But the reason that they said knew is because... The, you know, ancient Hebrews are very respectful. They wanted to keep it on the uh, PG, as you say. Yeah. So they would say, you know, uh, he knew his wife, meaning he had sex with his wife. You know, you couldn't, you can't know somebody more fully than after you're, you know, married and intimate. Yeah. They basically, they had seen each other physically naked and spiritually naked but prior to this point. So they are established, <laughs> you know? They know everything about each other. It's okay. Like and they and are, yeah. now they've seen each other's shame. Not only yes. their, you know, just nakedness, because, you know, they didn't even realize they were naked until they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now they realize they are nakedness, which we talked the Hebrew word meaning shame. Um, and now they've seen the best of each other and the worst of each other. Yes, exactly, exactly. And thus they bear these children. Uh, so the names are really significant here. So uh, we have Cain and Abel. Yes. You, you know, uh, we remember the last time that obviously she's going to have pain during childbearing. And when she says, uh, I have made a child with the Lord's help, it seems like it's kind of like a, a gratitude. Like God has still allowed me to fulfill my calling even though I sinned. Right. And I think it has even to do with uh, proto-evangelism mm. where God had made the promise that she, her seed would be the one to kill the serpent. Right. Um, to crush the head of the serpent. Wow, so maybe she And so I think she that. thought this was going to be that when really it was going to be, the, her, this first son was going to be on the side of Satan, not on the side of God, and unfortunately. And it might take a couple thousand years to get there. <laughs> right? Yes. Jesus doesn't come on the scene for a while, so she needs to be patient. She's going to learn patience in this, uh, this time here. And Cain, uh, in Hebrew, was pronounced kine, I taught you because it's like saying kind, like be kind to one another and take the D off. All right. Okay. Um, and Abel, do you remember? Havel. Yes. Havel. You got you to gotta <laughs> dig deep there in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay. So they have really significant uh, meanings because, um, you know, obviously when she says, she proclaims, I acquired a man with the help of the Lord, that is what is attributed to the meaning of the name Cain. So acquired. Um, right. It's part of it. There's also his name has a few meanings, right? Eventually, it comes to mean we think uh, that it comes to mean eventually strike or one who builds stones to strike fast. And don't forget, he's the one who strikes his brother to death. Yeah. So we were talking about whether this name uh, was originally given to him. Like, was he born with this name? Was it just a prophetic name, which very well could be the case? Yeah. Or did they start calling him this after the fact? And this brings us down the rocky road where we talk about Hebrew. So we have the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek. And so when you go to any sort of, you know, biblical school, um, they teach you 
that, you know, uh, the beginning of Judaism and the Hebrew language really started with Abraham. So we learned that even though, you know, we read Adam and Eve or, um, you know, Adama or um, yeah. Chava in Hebrew, that that may have not been their first name because this is the Hebrew writer oh. giving them, calling what their name would be in his own language. Moses wrote this. Moses wrote the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Um, and he wrote this in Hebrew. So he called Adam and Eve, Adam and Chava, by their Hebrew names because that's what he spoke. So we learn, you know, don't put too much into this because we don't know what actually their name was. And we hear, you know, we know the story about at the Tower of Babel where everyone's language was changed. But then I've been doing a lot, a lot of research and reading a lot of um, texts that are outside of the Bible, which I do not take as God's word at all, but some of them can definitely be valid some and incredible history. Um, just to use to know what's going on around the same time, part of the Apocrypha and, you know, parts of the Pseudepigrapha. Um, and uh, doing a lot of research, I had seen where there's mentioned that the original language was Hebrew, that this was what God used to create, to talk with everyone, to talk with Adam and Eve. That's what I so, thought. So I, so again, I'm saying this, take this with a grain of salt. Sure. It, it, it could be, it could be that Hebrew was the original language that they were named in and that God spoke to them in. And then it was lost at the Tower of Babel and reintroduced with God's chosen people, the beginning of Abraham, who was the father of the nation of the Jews, our father, Abraham. Um, so it could have absolutely been Hebrew lost language and then reestablished the language. Or it could have been where truly it was just a different language that we are not sure of and that, you know, Moses writing this used the Hebrew that he knew to, to name Adam and Eve. So the names have beautiful meanings. And I think the meaning of all the names and the symbolism behind the names are all still exact, still, you know, recorded perfectly. Um, but we're not sure. So it yeah. could have been Hebrew. We lean towards maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But oh, my whole life I was like, I don't think so because that's the way I learned in college. And just recently I'm starting to think and doing more and more research and talking to you, it makes sense that truly God's first original language could have been Hebrew. It does make sense to me uh, personally, you know, but what do I know? <laughs> I yes. wasn't there. Well, we'll move on. But the Keep point going. is that you, the names have significance. They carry significance for the story. And that's why when we come to the name Abel, um, Havel, or what is it? Right. Uh, yeah, so he, Hevel. You yeah, got it. You said it this right. is an interesting name because it actually means um, breath, vanity, vapor, vanity, mist, emptiness, meaninglessness. Which normally we wouldn't want to name our child right. vanity, but knowing the story, you know, since since we've read this and we will read this, um, we see that a, um, Abel's life was much shorter than it should have been. Yes. At that time, they were living close to a thousand years, and Abel's life was cut very, very short because Cain took his life. Yeah. And so it's it's beautiful to see that it's either his name was truly prophetic in the fullest sense, or they started calling him this after the fact, after Cain killed him. Our son was not here long enough. This is, you know, he was vanity. You know, life is so short. Life is, you know, comes and it goes in the breath in the wind. Definitely. And, yes. And I think um, because she very deliberately named Cain. Uh, it says like, you know, because I've gotten him from the help of the Lord and she named him Cain because of that. And it doesn't exactly say that she named uh, Abel at all or anybody named him. It just, his name just was Abel, you know? So uh, I think it's kind of interesting that usually it's traditional for the Hebrew names to reflect the situation of what's going on, uh, like what they are experiencing. So if we decide that Cain tells us that life comes from God, yes. Uh, maybe Abel tells us that she's also remembering the curse side of the last chapter where, uh, you know, it, life's going to be fleeting, life's going to be cut short. So it cut, kind of could be both at the same time. Um, but you actually made kind of like a really funny joke, in my opinion. I know it's a lame dad joke, but... This was a lame dad joke, and I was embarrassed, and I almost didn't want to put it I on the podcast. I wanted you to say it. I thought it was funny. But I had said that, you know, so at, um, um, Adam and Eve having... Uh, Abel and how Abel's name could mean vanity or also breath or breathe. I made the joke that, you know, while Eve was giving birth, that Adam painful, painful, painful birth, birth was going, breathe, <laughs> breathe, breathe. Ah, it's so yeah. terrible. You Such a bad joke, it. but that's, it <laughs> was like funnier it. in the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, well, I, they weren't necessarily twins though. Right. So, so people assume, um, um, that um, that they were twins because in the very first verse we see and again she bore his brother Abel immediately followed after it doesn't say that at any yeah. time 
you know, but that doesn't matter because we see so all over the place where somebody's being born and in the next sentence they're adults. So I don't take it as they were twins. I don't think they were twins. Yeah. And we've also read in different books, which we have it noted down. You'll help me find yeah. it. Um, where there is, there are uh, oral tradition and tradition that believes that they were seven years age difference, that mm -hmm. Cain was born seven years prior to Abel. Right, yes. Um, actually, the Byzantine chronograph uh, by George Sinellis. Right, know, yes, thank anyway. you. Uh, anyway, so that uh, is back in time, and it, it suggests that Cain may have been 70 and Abel 77 when the rest of the story takes place. So right. they were born possibly seven years apart. We don't know. For Both. So, so the twins thing is totally just an assumption based on the punctuation in the sentence. Which but it's also, it also makes sense for the story because these two are going to be juxtaposed against each other. Right. Like these are the focus of the story. It doesn't necessarily mean there weren't other children yet. Yeah. We'll get to that later. And, and I just want to make it very clear, unless the Bible says so, don't, don't die. Don't pick the hill to die on unless the Bible says so, because you know, we truly don't know if they were seven years apart. There's parts of the pseudepigrapha that I've read that said they were both born as twins with a, with a man and a woman and a sister. Um, so that would be their wife. I've also read a different part of the pseudo, a different book of the pseudepigrapha where it said that the reason there was fighting was because Cain wanted to marry the twin that was in the womb with his brother when really that was supposed to be his brother's wife. So it's all over the place. Yeah. So I just want to make it very clear. The Bible is God's word. Everything else outside of it, we're using it as assumptions and just history. Yeah, we don't have specific details. And if God like ordained it this way that we don't need the details, then we don't. maybe don't worry about them. Right. Uh, but we will get into the possibilities about like who Cain's wife was because that's kind of an interesting conversation anyway. And, and so one of the things a lot of people bring up is, you know, uh, we hear in the last chapter where God said that the day you, sure, um, you eat of it, you will surely die. Yeah. And so, but then why were people living close to a thousand years? Why did Adam die at, what was it, 930 years old? Yeah, I think so. You know? And so then we see actually elsewhere in scripture um, where a day um, or, it, tell, tell me it again. Amy. A day is as a thousand years. A thousand years with the Lord. So, so. I wouldn't have guessed this, but then there was, you know, a part of the Apocrypha, I was reading a book in the Apocrypha, where it says, you know, when God is saying, you know, the day you eat of this, it was a, a thousand year time period, which is why he didn't live an entire day, an entire thousand years. He died at 930 and didn't get the complete day. So that's, again, just a, a play on that or a suggestion on that. Why? Right. And I'm, you know, a lot of people kind of, when you hear this story, when you're growing up, you kind of assume that they're children when this happens. Right. Not necessarily. And if, if they do live to a thousand years, then if this dude's 70 and this dude's 77, like, then they're what equivalent you, like, of a seven, seven and an eight year old, seven and seven and a half. <laughs> like, exactly. Like, yeah. They are technically children, children in relative terms. In the scheme of, if you live to a thousand, you and I would be very young children. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. So, well, I don't know. Did we already say that the um, vanity, vanity, all is vanity is what Solomon says when we get to Ecclesiastes? Yeah, in Ecclesiastes. He's lamenting. He's like depressed. But Able, able, word, all is able. Exactly. It's the same word. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity is the same word that they use to, to name, name Abel. Abel. Exactly. So able, able, all is able. able is what they're really saying, which is kind of crazy. It's right? so deep. It, it, it shows you that. You know, the fleetingness life. of life and the meaningless of not life is not lost. It could end at any people. moment. Life Even is... people of God, like, are lamenting about this. Right. And thinking about it, in the scheme of eternity, like when Christ is reigning and we're with God after this life, you know, we are only living 100 years in today's standards. And if you think of 100 years to eternity, you can't even imagine it. But this life, again, life is just a, a snap in the scheme of things. It's a blink of an eye. Yes. Yes. I'm glad that you brought that up because my friend had brought up, uh, we were kind of talking about this because she had written, written a song about vanity. And I was like, wow, that like, totally aligns with my studies, like about Cain and Abel. And I had explained that Cain means gotten from the Lord and Abel means vanity. And she was like, what? Like, why would they, na why would they name them that? That seems opposite. And doesn't it mean that they... Didn't, didn't you screw that up? Like, doesn't it mean, like, um, Abel should have been gotten from the Lord and Cain should have been vanity? vanity. Uh, but because, you know, foreshadowing, uh, most of us know the story already. I'm going to ruin it for you if you don't. But uh, they, you know, Abel is killed prematurely and Cain goes on to build a beautiful city and have descendants who make cool instruments and stuff and tools. And he lives, like, what looks like a prosperous life. So that's why my friend was confused and she was saying like why would they name them that when obviously abel was the righteous one uh but i think that this goes this this is insightful to me because it kind of begs the question what is vanity to god and what is vanity to man so vanity to god uh we see from there's a, a line in hebrews 
It says, uh, it explains this. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved of his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. So, you know, it's not normal for humans to hear blood crying out from the ground, speaking right. through faith. But the life is in the blood. Right. That's but why God, God tells us not to eat the things. blood. And God's idea of righteousness is different. Like, if we think of Jesus, how he was always saying, like, woe to the scribes and the Pharisees who love their great spots in the assembly and they love getting, like, honored on the streets. Like, oh, bow to you, bow to you. He said, like, that's, that's stupid. Like, th this is done for man to see. This is not done for God. I think the same thing's going to be happening here with Cain and Abel. Cain, uh, you know, does this thing. Most people look at the glittery city. They don't look behind the veil. Uh, they, they look at what it appears that he has done, but they don't look at his heart. God is looking at your heart. So I think that they're appropriately, you know. I think they are appropriately named. Appropriately named obviously. for the moral of this story because, you know, uh, Abel's life was vain. Uh, it, it's easy for me to see how humans would see that his life is futile and pointless, but not according to God. And another thing uh, with Cain's name, with the, in, in the Hebrew, the, the root of it being very close to a uh, stone builder, mm. you know, we see that he tried to, so, so he was cursed, but you know, just like us, everyone, we try to fight back against the curse. It's only natural. So he was sentenced, you know, to the land of Nod as a wanderer to be wandering for the rest of his life. And how do you fight back against that curse? You try and build a stone wall, a city, so you could stay fortified, stay in the same place. Not like New York City, but this was just like a fortified settlement that he tried to make so he wouldn't have to be a lost wanderer. Yeah, yeah. And, and I also um, was just noting just like women giving birth today, a lot of times they're giving an epidural to help for what the pain so we were constantly fighting back against the curse yeah yeah that's crazy to think about okay so that's super interesting love that uh so next thing is the next verse now abel was a keeper of sheep and cain a worker of the ground in the course of time cain brought to the lord an offering of the fruit of the ground the hebrew word could also be produce and abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions and the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Ouch. Okay, so let's talk about that. Yeah, so again, we already kind of touched on this, but they don't explicitly say in the Bible why God didn't, well, not in this chapter at least, they don't explicitly say why God didn't accept a sacrifice. We already kind of looked at Hebrews in the future where we see that it, it's because his heart wasn't in the right place. Exactly. But... So, you know, I, I know a lot of people try and say that it has to do with the sacrifice mm -hmm. and that because um, Abel had brought, you know, his very, very best of his flock, probably the sheep he loved the absolute most to sacrifice. And that was a blood sacrifice. So blood was spilled. Blood is the covering of sin. But this was not a sin sacrifice. This was not supposed to be a sacrifice for sins. Yeah. This was a timely it's or... a mean half. Exactly. <laughs> which... You want to continue? Which is a gift offering or a recognition to the Lord that's done in a timely manner. Whether they did it uh, quarterly every year, twice a year, or yearly, this would be a gift offering to the Lord. And so we see that Abel gave the absolute very best of the best. You know, um, also Cain, um, in order in the Bible, brings his offering first. So he may have even brought his offering first to God. Yeah. Um, but the produce that he brought from his land was not the very best. I guarantee if he would have brought the very best of what he had in the same, and his heart was in the same position as Abel's was, it would have been accepted. And so, you know, we see that it's, it's truly their heart, his heart that was in the wrong place. And then we see, how do we know that God did or did not accept this offering? Yeah, well, I mean, um, there's speculation about this, but, yes. you know, when we go future time when we have the tabernacle worship um, i tend to believe this because most theologians actually do believe this and lean towards this and i really really like it well this is probably where the tabernacle tradition comes from in the first place right you know like we we already have the two cherubim who are standing there guarding the way to the garden yeah so there's they're cast out of the garden okay mm -hmm. and so we have two cherubim and the flaming sword just freely spinning in the middle of them. So that's there. That's in their environment. That's in their environment. And they're only east of this. They're right outside of this. So who's not to say that this is where they would bring their sacrifices. Yeah. And just like how it would happen, fire would come down from heaven and burn up the sacrifice to show that God accepted it. And it could have very easily happened right there in front of the cherubim and in front of both their eyes. Abel sees his sacrifice, goes up in flames, 
and we see Kane does not probably what's going on here right. so that's what we see like the visual representation of the two cherubim is on the ark of the covenant when we get to moses's time and that's where the priest goes to give the offering and yes in leviticus numbers deuteronomy there's a bunch of times where the the flames, flames come down down to right. accept to show that the offering was accepted uh chronicles was not not deuteronomy sorry uh but that may be what they did. Maybe we can envision that they walked up to the entrance of the garden where the two cherubim were. Maybe they built this altar. Maybe they saw a flame come down for Abel's, but not for Cain's. And there is such, such a strong oral tradition and history dating back to that time. That is that is what I believe now, that I do think that's how they knew that his did not, it was a burnt, burnt offering and his was not accepted by God because it was, did not go up in flames. Yeah. Maybe uh, Cain, like going back to vanity again, maybe he made something that was beautiful to man. Maybe he made this cool, like, fruit arrangement that was really pretty to men, but it wasn't pretty to God because his heart was like, and you know, what does it say in Proverbs? The, on the bottom here, it says the sacrifice of an evil person is detestable, especially when it is offered with the wrong motives. Even if Cain had brought like a greater blood sacrifice, it wouldn't have mattered. That's Proverbs 21, 27. Yeah, and several verses throughout the Bible show this. Like Lots, God, yeah. God doesn't delight in sacrifice. Why would he? God had made all the cows anyway. You're going to bring him something he made? It's about the state of your heart. It's about the reason that you're doing it. Absolutely. Uh, like God, like God. Anything you give back to God, God was originally the one who gave it to you. So. Exactly, exactly. So, so it really is the state of their heart. And we see right away, you know, I'm, I'm skipping ahead here, but before uh, Cain goes to kill his brother, God pulls him to the side and talks to him. Let's keep yeah. going. No, well, like, so last thing I wanted to say about that is that maybe uh, the reason that people often think that it's about the actual sacrifices is because, you know, in the last chapter, Adam and Eve had tried to make coverings for themselves out of leaves. So this is like a foliage thing. Exactly. And it was not, not acceptable. Good. Yes. And then when God, we assume, shed blood to create the skin covering. Using a lamb or sheep. To that use... was acceptable. Exactly. And this is all foreshadowing to Christ's sacrifice. So this could be part of it, but I don't think, you know... Cain probably wasn't in the know about this idea yet. However, it, it what his actions did still uh, fed into the grander story. You know, so. and and we see we see later on that Cain has severe anger. Mm. We see that obviously he's angry towards God. He's angry towards his brother, which is absolutely horrible. And honestly, we expect this. We don't expect to see Cain to bring a sheep. He's not a sheep herder. His brother is. That's his brother's job. Cain's job is a farmer to grow the produce. Yeah. So we would think you would bring what your lifestyle represents. Sure. So yeah. you know, I think he brought the uh, this uh, fine sacrifice, but it was brought with the wrong motives and the wrong intentions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, who knows who even told him to do that? Like, we don't know. There's no verse in here that says Adam told them to bring it to the Lord. No, exactly. Like, Cain's already kind of mad, right? Because, like, he is... You imagine a kid who's grown up in, a like, a, a bad parental situation. Where he's he, angry at his parents. He's mad that he, like didn't get to grow up in paradise because right. of their parents' sin. He's already mad that he has to toil for the ground. He's already mad that his brother is more favored than he is. That they live in a fallen state now. Apparently no reason to him. But imagine, imagine, I couldn't imagine looking at my parents and being like, you, you, God gave you everything, everything, a home, shelter, heat, air conditioning, perfect everything, okay? And you had to follow one rule, just one, and it wasn't even a hard rule. It's not something that's like absolutely insane. You yeah. have everything. And imagine if God's like, don't eat Cheetos. Yeah. I'm, like, oh, I'm going to have Cheetos out of everything. You know, it's just, it's just, I'm sure he would have been angry. Yeah. But there's different ways to handle it. Right. You know, he could have it, used his anger to build his relationship towards God, you know, and towards repenting. Yes. And this is why I said earlier that this is the first time that two religions are going head to head, right? Because one is a religion of War. faith and one is a religion of ritual. Like Cain's just doing it as a ritual. We'll see. One is the fa one is the son of Satan. One is the son of God. Right. Well, that um, reminds me of uh, the time when Jesus saw people coming to make their offerings to the temple. Right. And there was these um, like scribes and Pharisees and whatever they were. All these wealthy people donating lots of money and they're Showing like off. beating their breasts, feeling good about themselves. And then this one lady, like very humbly all she has is two coins and that's what she puts in and jesus is like stop she did better than all y'all amen i don't i don't care about any of your sacrifices this lady gave everything that she had right and that was that meant so much more to him than anything else because again god does god need your wealth no it, it helps humanity <laughs> it helps your brother and sister but it's god and it all comes from him turning it he turn created everything a stone into bread right Go on, Kane's Kane's mad. 
So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. I don't like that word contrary just because it's not in the Hebrew, but, but that's okay. So what I want to say here is one right away. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And then we also see God say to him, why has your face fallen? This is the same word, nephal, okay? Fallen ones, nephalim. So to fall, we see the nephalim, the fallen angels are called. The word in Hebrew is nephal, to fall. But in English, falling sounds like something accidental. This is not, this is a, a, a willing fall. This yeah. is a, a knowing fall. So I just wanted to say that it's pretty cool that they're using the exact same word. How you, you know, have fallen from heaven, oh Lucifer. Exactly. Yikes. Exactly. You got it. Well, uh, you know, it says, it actually says that he's burning, glowing with anger. Right. And we were kind of talking about that. We were talking about that because anytime anyone gets close with God, Moses goes up the mountain to talk to God. He comes down. He is glowing so bright that people are afraid of him. He's got to put a veil over his face because they're like, Moses, why are you glowing like this? <laughs> so we see that when you're in close proximity to God, you glow. And I wonder, God knew he was going to kill his brother, pulls him to the side and says, don't you know if you just do what it's what's right? You'll be accepted. All you have to do is follow my will and you will be accepted. And and he leaves glowing, but not glowing with the righteousness of God, glowing with his own unrighteousness and the anger after talking in God's presence. Maybe he's still glowing, but in wrath and anger, just like Lucifer. The light bearer. That's what Lucifer's known as. That's deep. That's literally what Lucifer means. So that's kind of crazy. Yes. Um, so, but again, so God is asking him. He's asking another rhetorical question here. Yeah, he's pulling him to the side. And what is he trying to get him to do? He's trying to get him to repent. Yeah. And to have a change of heart. Because he hasn't done it yet, right? Right. Like, he's, he's giving him a warning, a fair warning, saying like, literally, if you do what is right, you'll be fine. If you don't, sin is crouching at your door. This This could refer to... Maybe like an animal about to pounce, but sometimes you say it also refers to a demon. Right. So it's it's similar. Sin in, in this uh, phrasing is similar to the Akkadian word um, sin, which is they, they represent it as, as a demon at your door, like waiting to seduce you, waiting to grab you, waiting to um, inhabit you. Um, when also it's taken as the Hebrew word is really um, crouching at the door is, is like in a... Uh, an animal in an attacking position, like ready to ready to pounce on its prey. Yeah. You know what's the what am I trying to say? Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm yeah. trying to say? Yeah. Sure. So that's so it could be taken as either, and both of them are very similar meaning. But sin is right there, and it is waiting. It is waiting for you to just say hi, acknowledge <laughs> me, look my way, yeah. open this door, right. and it will immediately inhabit you. It's funny that you uh, said contrary again because you were upset about that same word last time. Yeah, don't like And the reason why is because a lot of people on the internet, you know, especially if you're entering into arguments about uh, when, how the Old Testament says you should treat women, uh, a lot of people will point out that um, Genesis 16, which talks about like, oh, your wife's desire, your desire, the desire is, uh, is going to be contrary to her husband's and he's going to rule over her. So it sounds very similar to your the Genesis 4 7, which says that it sin's desire is contrary I to love, you, but you must rule over it. Don't get me wrong. I love the ESV. I think it's such a good version. I see more and more people using it, but However, I just can't stand how it uses contrary because the word's not there and it's really like, I understand what it means, but it could be very easily a misrepresentation of what the Bible actually well, says. Well, what should it say then? Your your um, desire is for you, right? Your uh, Its desire is... Right. Yes. So it is kind of a different word. It's contrary to contrary. <laughs> but anyway, I think that this is different. And I think that they're obviously similar for a reason. But you're supposed to notice that Genesis 3.16 about the woman and uh, the husband. This is talking more about uh, relationship dynamics and hierarchy and trying to make sure and that... And gender roles. The roles for the men and the roles for the women. They need to respect each other and not go over the boundaries. But this... Um, 
this one in Genesis 4, it more personifies sin and it warns about an internal struggle rather than something external. Right. And we see how in the very beginning that to create sin, we had a, some had an outsour, uh, um, an outsourced form, Satan, the serpent, oh, yeah. going up to Eve and, and pushing Eve to sin. And now we see that we're in a fallen state. Sin comes naturally. We don't need to be pushed to sin. We could just sin on our own free will. Sin is getting easier and easier to commit. Yeah, that's already like in his DNA somehow. I don't know if that's fair to say, but... No, it is. I mean, because now we're in a fallen state. We're still made in the image of God, but in a fallen state. Yeah, he already just like, he didn't need somebody to push him to do that. He just like wanted to do it himself because he's mad. And I love your little note here. Um, you know, uh, you, you notate uh, Samson and Delilah, um, which is a absolute great story because... You know, Samson's parents, I'm going to just do a 10 second just on this. Samson's parents did not want him to marry a Philistine woman. He married a Philistine woman. The woman had the wrong intention. She kept trying to trick him so her people could kill him because he killed a lot of her people. And so she kept nagging and nagging and nagging. He kept lying to her and tricking her. And finally, she got so upset and he got tired of hearing her upset. So he said, if you cut my hair, I will lose my strength, which was the truth because he had taken a Nazarite vow to follow a Nazarite vow. You can't touch dead bodies or make dead bodies like Samson did. You can't drink alcohol. You can't cut your hair. So she found the secret. She cut his hair. He lost his strength. So that's something where we see that's contrary. That's where we see a man and a woman being contrary to uh, each other. Yes. So I just wanted well, to throw that out. that's what it is because um, Eve manipulated her husband. Exactly. Her curse was to be mastered by her husband. Mm -hmm. And likewise, if you let sin manipulate you, your curse is going to have you be mastered by the sin. We've all seen this happen in our lives and everybody else's lives. This happens a lot. Like right. Sin masters you. Yeah. You need to rule over And it. sin can so easily become an idol because once you start committing that sin more than your relationship with God, mm -hmm. guess what you just put above God? Now you have not only sin, but an idol of sin. Yeah. So let's watch Cain screw this up. Okay, so verse 8. <laughs> Cain spoke to Abel his brother. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So... Mm -hmm. We learn um, there are some, we'll, we'll go over in detail, but there are, are some Bibles that make it sound less premeditated than it is, but this was absolute, absolutely premeditated murder. This had been on his heart for a while, and what's the worst part about this is he takes his, God had just pulled him to the side. He's very angry, glowing with anger with God. He's in a, in a fall, fallen state, and he takes his anger out that he has towards God on his brother. And now he takes his brother's life, his brother's life. He murders his brother and has already pondered it, already thought about it. I don't think this was a spur of the moment. This was, we have here the, the Latin Vulgate, the Greek Septuagint, the Samaritan Pentateuch, and the Syriac text all add the phrase, let's go out to the field, attributed to Cain speaking to Abel. This suggests it was absolutely a premeditated murder. Yeah. Well, if you think about what Jesus says in the New Testament, like saying, uh, you know, even if you have anger in your heart towards your brother, you've already killed him. Exactly. In a, way, in a spiritual way. Right. So that's why he takes him aside. If you lost after to another woman, you're already committing adultery against your wife. Yikes. Right. So uh, that's, uh, it's, you know, but like he couldn't wait to murder his brother. That's why God pulled him to the side and uh, warned him in the first place, right before this happens. Yeah. Immediately. It, it reminds me of, um, so my dad is a poet and he wrote a poem a long time ago that has always been stuck in my head. Like something in life that's strangely related. The more you're loved, the more you're hated. And I think that kind of relates here to Cain I love your Abel. dad. I know he's the best. <laughs> Shout out to dad. But yeah, this relates because, you know, I can think of situations in the past when, like, you know, I remember when I was going to school and one of my friends who used to come over to study, she would always be kind of angry at me that I didn't have to study as hard as she did to get better grades. Like she would put in way more work and I would not. And I would still get better grades than her. And she was mad. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Uh, you know, like, and I'm sure that I've, committed the same anger towards a brother or sister that was unrighteous. Uh, it makes sense that like, you know, people, especially, you can see it, the most easy example is like seeing people in the spotlight, especially in politics and stuff, like people that are very uplifted by others get teared down a lot. Right. Uh, so it's interesting to see that people who are favored, who appear to be favored by God, uh, sometimes are the uh, object of hatred absolutely you see all of his prophets are because hated. of jealousy right because of like deep deep jealousy and maybe he like thought he could get away with this i don't know I and don't every know why. every false prophet 
would come to Israel and say, oh, love and peace, love and peace. And they were loved and they were rejoiced and they were celebrated and they were false prophets. And then God would send his prophet and he would say, repent, repent. And they would want to stone him. They would want to murder him because they didn't want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Well, um, the way that Jordan Peterson interprets the Cain and Abel story is that, like, the last thing you want to hear if you know that your life's, like, in shambles is to hear that it's your fault. Like, you oh, don't, yeah. you, like, it's because your heart is wrong. But it is. And honestly, it, it's hard for all of us to accept. But even, even myself, I had a terrible, terrible ha habit where, like, I enjoyed, like, just, like, complaining about people and talking about drama and I realized to like, this is, this is so sinful to get out of this. Every time my mind goes there and I go to either say something or think something, no matter what, I'm going to use that to remind myself to praise God. And it allows me every time I go to, or have a slip up, I praise God to where I've gotten in the habit now where I'm only praising God. And it is really, it is such a blessing. You have to stay humble. It's so easy yeah. for so many people. Like the second you start being successful in anything, even if it's at your church, you start becoming successful in some sense. You start growing the church and making it bigger. If you're a pastor or something, it's so easy for us to get, get in our heads and, and build ourselves up to more than we are, but we're nothing but dust without Christ. And it's the Holy spirit who's allowing us to do this. And we would never be able to do this on our own without the spirit of Christ. So it's, it's such a blessing. And we always have to remember to stay humble. Being, being humble is one of the most important things in the sight of God. All those who humble themselves will be exalted and all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. But you got to think about the vanity from God's perspective. Because you, otherwise you fall into the Solomon lament saying like, oh God, why is this, why is this guy who exalts himself not being humbled yet? Wait. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, yeah, the message that you heard from the beginning, this is from 1 John 3.11, I thought was relevant. Uh, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from life to death, oh, from death to life, because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Kind That's of so true. That's old. so true. And I try and remember everyone. What can you take to heaven? I can't take my favorite water bottle to heaven. I can't take my headphones. I can't take my podcast to heaven. You know what I can take to heaven? Any single soul that I bring to Christ, anyone who I'm, I'm able to help find Jesus Christ, I can bring to heaven. And guess what? That's the biggest and most important, important reward of them all. Amen. Well said. Okay. So, so the next, uh, I think probably the next page is going to be, um, the Lord said to Cain. Then, this is verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Ooh, we got a lot to talk about that. here. Okay, so here's in in the uh, tradition of Israelites and Jews, the yeah. firstborn. Okay, you are your brother's keeper. You are your brother's keeper. Duh. If something were to happen to the father, um, in this case Adam, guess what? Cain would now become the head of the household, responsible for his brother that he murdered. He truly is. God is literally saying, you're your brother's keeper. What are you doing? Yeah. And we also see that I like to make very clear. So in, in most of our texts, we see the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So if we look up the Hebrew word, okay, it's really to scream or shriek ah. from the ground. Um, is that screaming are you out for divine aid specifically? Yes, yes, and it, it, screaming for divine aid or shrieking for divine aid. So it wasn't just like a cry. He was his blood was screaming from the ground yes. to God. That's why oh, this is totally irrelevant. Well, not really, but I, I feel like that's why when you go to uh, places in um, Quick today's question. world, Quick what? is, is uh, sixty-eight seventeen. Is that Strong's Concord? Strong's Concord. Okay, so if if anyone wants to look it up for uh, crying, for his blood is crying, so you can see that it means shriek or to scream uh, in a divine sense. It's Strong's Concord in sixty-eight seventeen. 
Just want yeah. to put that out. Please keep going. Well, I was just going to say, you know, like how people go and they go to like uh, grounds where there was a, a bloodbath, like a, a horrible, horrific war. Like some like very spiritual people like to tell you like, oh, I feel terrible. Here. Yeah, there's Something some feels terrible really energy weird. here. Yeah, maybe that's Life like is in the blood, guys. The literal blood crying out. I don't know that we can't hear. But that's why we're not supposed okay. to eat blood or drink blood. Oh, ugh. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, God is here again. He's not ignorant of the fact that he already killed Abel. You right. Know, he's, uh, he's. I think he's looking again. Are you gonna repent? A- yeah. Yet again. Same thing he did for Adam. Like, what is this that you've done here? Can you explain this to me? And then um, Adam did better than Cain did here. Cain's just being a stubborn little child about this. Like uh, he was like, I don't know. And now Cain is gonna get a similar curse to the serpent, where it's a, a direct curse from God yeah. in verse eleven. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So literally, his entire life revolves around farming. This yeah. is his entire lifestyle. That's what he wanted And now to God do. is set, telling him, no longer will you be able to yield anything from the ground. Because the ground swallowed you force the ground to swallow your brother's blood the vengeance of the ground will no longer provide anything for you ever again because you forced it to swallow your brother's blood and that's what's happening here so he forced the ground to take his brother's blood and now the ground will never provide for cain again never no matter what he does no matter adam could toil by the sweat of his brow by the pain of his labor yeah sorry i'm spitting (laughs) he could he could grow produce yeah but now this was going to be impossible now his potential is stripped. It's gone. And like, it's kind of ironic that Cain is, you know, how we mentioned that when Eve named Cain, she was acknowledging that um, despite the curse, like her potential was not stripped from her. Mm-hmm. But now Cain, like, is. because of his lifestyle choices, his life's basically ruined. Like what a terrible, terrible curse this is. And he acknowledges so, um, you know. Well, it's also a play on words kind of because, um, you know, when you when you work the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. And remember that Adam, his name means dirt, dust, the ground. Right. Uh, so you are cursed from Adama. Exactly. You are more cursed than Adam. You are banished from Adam. You're more cursed than the ground. You're so banished ha- from the ground. I'm so happy you said that. Amazing. Truly. So what does Cain say? He's kind of upset. So verse 13 <laughs> and 14. Cain said to the Lord, let's, let's pray. He says, God, I'm so sorry. That'd be nice. My heart, it's so heavy. I wish I didn't do this. I regret this, God. Wait. Oh, wait. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment, only my punishment, is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Yeah. So I I, I really love this, because no matter what happens, God is just always showing his forgiveness, always showing his redemptive purposes, always showing that he is just so much better than we will ever be. Could have just struck the guy dead right there. Just like, okay, Adam and Eve could have been thrown out of the garden with their fig leaves, butt naked, in their shame, (laughs) with their fig leaves falling apart, hanging off, okay? But God still had the realization to say, I'm going to cover you still as my children and 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 makes them clothes and yeah. puts clothes on them before they have to leave. Just like we see here. So Cain believes, I didn't get there yet, but Cain believes and is right. Whoever finds him is going to kill him. Why? Because right now, everyone on the earth right now is part of his family. Everyone on earth right now are the descendants of Adam and Eve. So imagine Abel was probably really well liked. He was probably a really nice guy. We listened to one Hebrew scholar that said he was a ladies' man among his sisters. I don't know where he got that from. I thought it was kind of funny. But I definitely believe he was well liked, unlike Cain, who was probably more angry. And so I guarantee that some of the family members, brothers, sisters, Adam Eve, the parents, would be so upset that they took that Cain killed his brother that they might have wanted to have vengeance and kill him and a life for life. And God didn't want to see everything he has established so far just just be murdered, the ground swallow everyone's blood because now vengeance and Satan's gain and scheme is going to take a hold. God doesn't want that. So God puts a mark on him, which we'll read in the next verse, which is going to protect him. Yeah, so you're right. So eventually we come to the point where in Leviticus it says like uh, a man who injures his countryman as he has done so shall be done to them. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. 
you know, just as another person received the injury, so will it be given to him. However, so this is like long after. Uh, and and Hammurabi's code, so um, the an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, mm -hmm. okay? It was never to teach somebody like how to really hurt or how to really punish somebody. It was because people were an actor greater punishments than what somebody deserved. Like if I were to punch you yeah. and then you were to kill me for as, as retribution, this was established so that there was e even there was there was justice that there was not just you know anything happens and now you could just kill anyone you want putting this a was supposed limit to, exactly this was supposed to uh, uh, imply a limit yeah it could be put a ceiling on it but then of course later uh in the new testament uh jesus says ye have heard that it has been and said an eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth but i say unto you that ye resist not evil but whoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek turn off him to also the other so like you know turn the other cheek to somebody who slaps you like it goes it, like even further and we'll talk about that more when it gets to 70 times seven but you know the so in the beginning god's intention was not for anybody to uh bring revenge on cain and that's why he's going to give him something he's going to give him this gift actually like uh that's it's a miracle uh, the word for mark can also be miracle yeah yeah, okay, so Cain, not concerned with his guilt or shame, but his punishment. No, yeah, he only cares about his punishment. He has no regret. He just says, this punishment is more than I can bear. Not my shame, not I'm so sad I killed my brother. I love him. God, forgive me. Bring him back. No, he just says that what you're saying now, my punishment, is more great than I can bear. Yeah. I'm never going to be near you again. I'm going to be away from you. Therefore, I'm going to have no one, no protection. And now anyone's going to kill me. Anyone's going to want to kill me. And God says, not so. You might be a wanderer, but I'm going to put a mark on you. I am going to provide a miracle to you to give you basically a, a sort of redemption. Yeah. So let's talk for a second about why he thinks he's going to have to hide. Because um, there's a couple different, you know, uh, reasons that people think that there were other people in the area. Like somebody that we, well, you know, one of the col college professors that you liked for a while was Elaine Phillips. And her husband, Perry Phillips, did a lot of research into this idea. And they developed this um, concept that perhaps there were other human-like creatures on the Earth at this time. Yes. Yeah, so what she had suggested is that Adam and Eve were the first people made as the image of God, but that there may have been other uh, homo sapiens, but not quite Neanderthals, humanoids. half humanoids, the outside of the garden, not made in the image of God. I don't believe that at all. That is so far from the truth that if, if you try and put that into biblical theology, it does not fit at all. Uh, I 100% uh, I am so sure in my heart that we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. Yeah, well, it says in Acts uh, 17 from... 1726, from one man he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their important times and the boundaries of where they live. So I do think that like it all comes from one man and one woman. And the fact, or, or the idea that there would have been other like non-totally human, like not blessed human. Racist. Running around, yeah. Kind of goes back to the whole evolution idea. I yeah. Think like it's trying really hard to like fit into the whole Neanderthal theory. Mm -hmm. And you and I kind of just It goes back that. to Darwin who thinks that black people or African-Americans are closer to monkeys and Neanderthals and less of a person than actually Caucasian people, which is Not insane, cool. which is insane. We're all made in the image of God, no matter how much or how little melanin is in our skin does not matter. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's Would a, you read just uh, what we noted from the Worsby commentary real quick? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, from the Worsby commentary, it says a vag vagabond has no home. A fugitive is running from home. A stranger is away from home, and a pilgrim is heading home. Uh, so obviously here, the vagabond is the worst situation. Which is what Cain no is now. Cain is a vagabond. He's going to be a vagabond, and he's just going to wander, and, you know, that's why he... thinks he, he's going to have to hide the rest of his life. That's why he builds a city. And uh, my uh, head is blocking it, but uh, right here, <laughs> this is the Worsby commentary for the Old Testament and New Testament, and I would highly recommend it. It's wonderful. Cute. Okay, yeah, so we already kind of went into this. Um, yeah, but... The fact of the matter is that there are other people, right? Um, and siblings. Yeah. Other siblings of... Uh, of Cain, and, Cain Abel. and Abel. Children, descendants of Adam and Eve. Women. There's Men. And there probably have been people that have already been expelled from this, uh, like, post... Uh, yeah. Cain Eden is probably the, the archetype of how you get expelled from the right. garden. You know, I guarantee there were other people who sinned in different ways because, you know, it... I forget where in the Bible, but it says so, so clearly, even if we were to just record the works of Jesus alone, the Bible would not be able to fit in the earth. Yeah. You know what I mean? It would be so much. So we see Cain as the archetype of why, what happens to be thrown out or to be cast out. 
And I guarantee there were others like this. I think that's already the archetype is the perfect word there because yeah, like Cain and Abel, like we focused on them because they are the important moral of the story. What we take away from the story is the most important that needs to be communicated. His wife, so Cain gets married, and his wife could have very easily have been already expelled. Or he could have already liked someone or been in some a relationship with one of his sisters and said, I'm getting expelled, but you're coming with me. I can't handle this curse alone. You're coming with me. Yeah. True. These two ways could have happened. The Bible doesn't say. It doesn't say. And it doesn't have to because no. we were like boiling down to the point here. Like like when you read Sherlock Holmes, it doesn't say, and then Sherlock stopped to go to the bathroom at two o'clock in the afternoon. You know, yeah. like you have the important details here. So don't like stress too much about who Cain marries. And there were no restrictions on marrying siblings yet. There was, you know, there was no... Right. The yeah. DNA was not all messed up. It's all like pretty pure at this point. Absolutely. And um, the Book of Jubilees, which is not canonical, but actually is pretty. Uh, it's good. it's yeah part of the Jewish apocrypha. It's it's historical. Lore. Yes, and I love the. I would highly recommend to anyone to read the Book of Jub- Jubilees and the first Book of Enoch. It's basically Genesis, but with like a little bit more information. And it's, what it says is that it's um, coined as Little Genesis. Yeah, but it's kind of like bigger Genesis if you have me. Yes. But um. Uh, that says that Cain's wife was his sister, specifically, right. and her name was Awar. So, it teaches you so fact. many questions that are left out in the Bible. And again, don't take it as God's word, but I believe truly that it's accurate history. And I love it. And it, it expands my vision and helps me learn so much more on how to teach you guys and how to teach me more. It allows you to understand what the uh, people who were first exposed to this stuff were thinking. Amen. Okay, what does the Lord say? Then the Lord said to him, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest anyone who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Yeah. Yeah, you already said Nod means wanderer. Right. Um, and then um, when God says vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold, uh, sevenfold is another way of saying complete vengeance. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, um, that's why, because in the first uh, days of creation, seven was the last one. Right, so and we said God didn't want there to be a chain reaction. Mm-hmm. He didn't want another sibling now to kill Cain, and then, you know, Cain's wife to kill him, and then vice versa. Everyone, everyone, it's a bloodbath. He didn't want that. Don't want that. Which is why he provided another miracle. How nice. Yeah, this is like, you know, you got to realize that it, in the beginning of time, God is extremely merciful. And like, everybody's always like, oh, Old Testament God, he's terrible. Like, wait till you see what happens and why he acts the way he acts. Right. You know? Like, just kind of, you know, and... um. It's funny because this is, sevenfold is always associated, in, at least in my '90s baby mind, is always associated with like emo music, like a right. bench seven. So if somebody were seventy times seven, if somebody were to go after Cain, it would be no small punishment. Their punishment right. would be complete. A big deal, yeah. yeah exactly. That's that's the point here. Okay, seventeen through twenty-two. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. When he built a city. He called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Arad, and Arad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. And Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Adah, and the name of the other was Zillah. Adah bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's names were Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and the pipe, Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain. He was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. Okay, I want to point out again that all this vanity looks really good right now, but by the way, it's the whole city and all of Cain's lineage is going to get wiped out in the flood. Yep. So don't get too excited. Yep. Uh, he, he built the city motivated by fear because he lacks faith in God. God gave him a mark, doesn't believe God. And do you want to just explain um, how um, the descendants of Cain, like this was not pure Enoch, this was not good Enoch? Oh yeah, there's two Enochs. Okay, so we're going to talk about the book of Enoch in the next Next. chapter. Next, yes. Because there is a good Enoch, but it's not this This is not him. I just don't want you guys to get confused. They, both lines, named their kids very, very similar things. Yes. So there are two Enochs, but from Cain, these are not the good descendants. The name Enoch means consecrated. We do not know consecrated to whom. The right. good Enoch, we assume, is consecrated to God. This one, perhaps, was he consecrated Maybe consecrated to, to the city. I don't know. 
consecrated to the city, fine. You know? Uh, but the thing that we notice with these lions, how there are so many similar names, like a bunch of these are similar, actually. Uh, but they're, that Satan is always the counterfeiter. He's always going to try to copy God. He's always going to try to mock God. Uh, so the two lines that have very similar names are a good way of um, illustrating this because, uh, you know, God is, Satan's going to try to copy God's righteousness to entrap people. Right. So just be aware. This is and and remind me the name of the gentleman who um, um, was gifted the Holy Spirit to build the tabernacle. Bazel? Bazel? Uh, it's it's got to be in the beginning. Bazel. Okay, so so <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I can look it up. Um, but basically, so um, we see in the Bible where God is able to teach people by just giving them the, the you know a spirit filled with you know blessings and good works on how to accomplish and, and do things like he did for him on how sure. to build the Ark of the Covenant. But also by reading the Book of Jubilees, we see that the fallen angels, the uh, Nephal, the Nephilim, uh, the fallen angels were the one who actually taught a lot of Cain's descendants and, and people um, uh, in the Old Testament, like how to build things, how to, how to forge metal, how to do things for evil, how to build this, how to do that. So yeah. there's a lot you learn. Um, okay. And according to Jubilees, uh, uh, Cain's wife's name was yeah. Awar, A-W-A-R, and she was his sister. That's mm -hmm. also um, uh, laid out in the book of Jubilees. Um, Lamech. Lamech, so Lamech's was going to happen next. He's going to have this speech. This is technically a song. Uh, but he is apparently the first polygamist. In yes, the he's the first one to take two wives. Does not necessarily mean that the Bible condones polygamy. And uh, Rash, I do not believe this, but his his wives have very interesting names. Okay. So the, the name... Uh, Zilla and... Oh, wait. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so we have... Um, the meaning of the first wife's name is actually adornment, like to be adorned, or ornament, like a symbol of beauty, okay? And the name for his second wife is shadow or to be hidden. So Rashi suggests that he had two wives, one for bearing children and one for being beautiful to look at, which I think is absolutely an ex insane way of explaining this. Um, I don't think there's much credibility to that. But, you know, their names do have meanings that we don't know the reason yeah. behind it. It could be it could be interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's who he addresses in this song that he's about to say, these two wives. Um, and we think it's a song, it's commonly known as the Song of the Sword. Right. And um, this is, uh, in theory, a at least a poem, but probably was sung to music. And it's, uh, Lamech's name is very associated with the word king. I think if you just rearrange the first two letters, it means king. Uh, it also means powerful or strong. So we have reason to believe that Lamech might have been the first king. And kingship is associated with song. Usually, like, you know, the king is ushered in through song. Like, if you think of King David, it's totally like all the time was singing and stuff and dancing and, and being cool right uh, so this is the song of the sword that's about to happen next right so verses 23 and 24 is the poem of Lamech Lamech said to his wives Ada and Zillah hear my voice you wives of Lamech listen to what I say I have killed a man for wounding me a young man for striking me if Cain's revenge is sevenfold then Lamech's is seventy sevenfold so what what is Lamech saying here? He's being a... a boastful. A, yeah. Very boastful. Thank you this for, is not a humble... This is bragging, say. saying, you know, like, that his punish... If anyone tries to hurt him, his punishment is going to be so much greater granted by God when this he is just being full of himself. Reminds me of, you know, how people will say... You know, in Romans, if we have the thing where it says you know what shall we say then if if god's grace is increased when my sin is increased then shouldn't i sin more i think this goes right back to lamech like i think this yes. is kind of what he's saying like oh well if cain got like so so much grace from his murder why don't i just murder everybody and then uh, i'll get so much grace i'm the gracefulest dude in the world i'm gonna kill everybody and god's gonna love it yay yeah but he's being uh meanie he's not being cool and one more, um, really quick, we're running out of time. Um, but um, so in, in this poetry, one of the reasons that uh, Rashi also suggests that uh, uh, Lamech wrote this poem is he believed that, um, again, this is all just hearsay outside of the Bible. I don't believe it. Just, just, just uh, speculation. Just speculation. Okay. Um, said that Lamech was blind or almost blind and went hunting with his son. And he said the mark that God had given Cain was actually a horn on his head. Don't know where he gets any of this. So he said, 
Lamech's son said, you know, dad, dad, over there is an animal. So, you know, Lamech not being able to see, shoots and kills Cain, realizes that he has killed Jama, his grand... Cain. No, Cain. Oh, really? Kills Cain, okay. yes. Realize that he's killed Cain, the one with the horn, because he thought oh. his son thought he was an animal, the one okay. with the mark. Cain is the one who's marked. And um, starts freaking out and starts crying and ends up killing, like clapping and killing his son out of anger because now he just killed basically his greatest ancestor, the one who made the city of Nod, you know, the one who, who has the greatest closest connection to the beginning of time and so he is basically worried about this um and going to his wives um but again that's just you know that's yeah. just hearsay we don't know that the mark some people say that the mark cain was given was a dog and that's how dogs became man's best friend i don't believe that either i really just think it was is a miracle of protection what it what it might have been whether it was a mark on the head whether you know it, like a physical mark or some sort Probably you know spiritual if you ask me like it that had sounds to like the evolution of folklore. Yes. Uh, so, like, people trying really hard to figure out what this means and, like, going in the physical direction rather than thinking spiritually. So I think we should definitely always be sp thinking spiritually about these things. It was probably a spiritual mark that, like, you know. Absolutely. I agree. And um, it doesn't, you know, when it says 70 times 7 or 77-fold, seven, um, not clear if it's 77 or 490 or Okay, whatever. so some versions, you know, say um, 77, and somebody, some versions say 70 times 7, which equals 490. I truly believe it is 77 um, just because I think Jesus quotes Lamech. I think it has oh, to yeah. be that because that's what Jesus is quoting. Right. Yes. So, um, okay, so there verses 25 and 26, the last two verses of chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay. They began to testify about the Lord and, like, his goodness. Right. So, so Seth was going to be the holy holy line now. Yes. Um, in replace in for Abel. Abel, who was killed by Cain. And Seth means granted. Yes. Uh, so this reinstates the hope that the Messiah is still going to crush the serpent um, because, you know. She'll bear that seed. That that whole thing happened with Cain and Abel. That wasn't so good, and everybody was very discouraged. But this is back. More encouragement. Yay. Yes. And um, it doesn't say how Cain died, but the last Okay, thing. so the Bible doesn't stay, say how Cain died, but Jubilees does. Yeah. And I truly believe it, and I think it's absolutely wonderful. I like So Jubilees. the root word of his name, he's a stone builder, okay? He built his house out of stone. Guess how he dies in Jubilees? His stone house falls upon him. His own building, his own stone house falls upon him and kills him. And honestly, I believe it. I yeah. think that is how it happened because it, be it matches so well yeah. with the history of the Bible. It doesn't matter what physically happened to him, though, because all appoint are appointed to die once and then face judgment. So, again, the physical doesn't matter as much as the spiritual, and the spiritual is when he And unfortunately, I don't it. think Cain was saved. I don't think he ever—it didn't seem like he was the he type of person repenting. to ever repent. He was more concerned about his punishment. Yeah. Not a good look, guys. So, yes, uh, we have just hit an hour, so— Yeah, a little God. over. So, we're going to call it. And we will, please check us out, uh, like our video. If you would comment, it helps the algor algorithm so much. Um, even if you click like and just put like one word comment, like nice, YouTube <laughs> spreads it to a bunch more people. So a bunch more people get to hear the word of God. So if we could just ask, if you liked our video, to please help us do that. Um, you know, if you have any prayer requests, feel free, shoot, put them in the comments, send them to us directly. We'll be happy to talk to you if you want help. Couple counseling, we're here, or we're questions. awesome. Any kind of questions, any biblical questions, we're here to help you guys and talk to you guys. We post all of our shorts also on TikTok, also under the hammered lampstand. And uh, we love you all. We hope you all, you know, have a wonderful relationship with God, love him as much as we do, uh, and continue to win souls for Christ because that's what we're here to do. We're vice regents of God. Don't go the way of gain. You wanna close out in prayer real quick? Yes. Okay. Dear God, thank you so much for bringing us together. Thank you so much for allowing us to have this platform where we could reach other people. Thank you so much for providing for us and doing everything that you do. We're sorry for our sins. We're sorry for the sins that we don't even realize we're doing. We're sorry for our family sins and our friends sins. Please uplift us and teach us your way and guide us always and never let us go the way of Cain. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you all. May God bless you with his chesed love, his everlasting love. And we will see you soon on Genesis chapter 5. Get Some ready. Special see you added then. for that one, too.